Hello everyone. I'm David Fraser in the Animal Welfare Program at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. And thank you for joining me today to explore the question, what do we mean by one welfare? One welfare is a term that people are starting to use to recognize that human welfare, animal welfare are closely connected and that both are influenced by the environment in which we all live. Exploring the concept leads us into a wide range of topics, including the role of human mental health in animal welfare, the behavioral rehabilitation of animals and people, and the need for coordinated action be uh, between the animal welfare and conservation movements. So this will be an unusually wide-ranging talk. Uh, but maybe first a bit of background. The term One Welfare obviously grew out of the more familiar term One Health, which we use to recognize that human health and animal health are interdependent and bound to the ecosystems in which they exist. And as just an example of the One Health concept, some of you may remember the, that in 1998, Malaysia experienced a, a sudden outbreak of a mysterious illness that killed a huge number of pigs and over a hundred people, many of them pig farm workers. The illness was traced to the Nipah virus, which is carried by these creatures, uh, forest uh, living fruit bats, uh, native to Malaysia, who have probably been carrying Nipah virus for, for thousands or tens of thousands of years without causing serious problems to the bats. Well, here's what seems to have happened. In the, in the two decades leading up to the outbreak, Malaysia had had a lot of deforestation that reduced the habitat available for the bats. Then, in 1997-98, slash-and-burn agriculture, combined with a severe drought, led to a, a horrible, prolonged haze over the country. Here it is in satellite imagery. And it was so severe that it caused less fruit to be available on forest trees, whereupon the bats moved into cultivated orchards. And there, bat droppings and partly eaten fruit fell into pig enclosures that were located below the trees, passing the disease first to the pigs and from the pigs to the human workers. So here was a, a classic example of one health, where damage to the environment put stress on a population of wild animals, uh, and a new form of contact between wildlife and human settlements, and then a disease of the wild animals was transmitted to a domestic animal and then to people. One health is now an established term that's usually used to refer to communicable diseases. One welfare is starting to be used to capture some of the other connections that link animal welfare, human welfare, and the environment. But what exactly are these links? The first I'd like to suggest, and maybe most obvious, is that improving animal welfare often improves human welfare and, and vice versa. And let's just take a few examples from different parts of the world. Of course, a vast number of animals are used for transportation, sometimes under very poor conditions. Here is the remarkable Professor N. S. Ramaswamy, who took up the cause of these animals in India and urged people to take simple steps to improve their welfare. He called for well-designed harnesses uh, that don't cause animals injury, adequate nutrition to meet the needs of animals that are expending high levels of energy, and more efficient carts so that the animal's energy isn't wasted. And he estimated that each of these measures could roughly double the working power of the animals and improve the livelihood of the animal's owners. Uh, animal rescue. Well, we're all familiar with animal rescue for dogs and cats, but in India, the cow, of course, is a, a sacred animal, and the slaughter of cows is prohibited in most parts of the country. But when cows stop producing milk, many are abandoned and eke out a marginal, low-welfare existence, sometimes eating garbage and ingesting plastics that form a potentially fatal uh, plastic ball in the rumen. Fortunately, Indian society has a long tradition of goshalas, or animal rescue centers, that provide care for unwanted cattle. 
In fact, there are several thousand Goshalas in India, many with a thousand or more animals, so this is a, a huge population of animals in shelters. To create additional benefits, the Animal Welfare Board of India has a modernization program that uses cattle in Goshalas to generate biogas from manure, to produce vermicompost from manure and earthworms, to use the animals for draft power, for training of local people to use draft power, and then with this huge number of animals, uh, they use them for genetic improvement of local breeds. So here is a clear case where solving a problem of animal welfare by sheltering stray cows can have multiple benefits for the community. This is an interesting example of animal and human rehabilitation that involves a cooperative program between a prison and an animal shelter, whereby prisoners work with dogs that have serious behavior problems. Rehabilitating dogs with behavior problems is, is often possible, but very time-consuming, probably too time-consuming, for shelter staff. But in programs like this, dogs that would otherwise be euthanized because of behavior problems are brought to a prison where selected inmates work intensively to calm and train and socialize the animals so that they can be adopted or even become assistance animals helping people with disabilities. The benefit to the dogs is obvious, but the program is also said to be very beneficial to the prisoners by helping them develop a sense of responsibility, develop patience, tolerance, empathy, and achieve a sense of satisfaction through service. And the program is also reported to, to create positive interaction among the prisoners and reduce stress in the prison. Of course, the links between human and animal welfare are particularly a, a, a clear in the case of animal production. In 2008, a group of us met in Rome to advise the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, on how they might engage in promoting farm animal welfare in their member countries, especially countries with less developed economies. In the world's poorer countries, we sometimes hear the argument that, that animal welfare is merely a rich country preoccupation that would be a distraction for them and their emphasis on the welfare of their human citizens. So one of the goals of our, our, our meeting in 2008 was to identify ways in which human welfare and animal welfare are linked in a production environment. The outcome was a, a booklet called Capacity Building to Implement Good Animal Welfare Practices, which is readily available online. And some of the links between human and animal welfare that we saw include that good handling, which improves growth and reproduction, good nutrition to improve production efficiency, safe, com comfortable environments to prevent loss through injuries, good loading and transport to reduce losses through stress, and sanitation and hygiene to improve animal welfare and also food safety. And as just one example of the first point about the benefits of, of good handling, the field is indebted to the Australian Paul Hemsworth, shown here many decades ago, and with his book, Human Livestock Interactions, for years of research on how the handling of farm animals affects both their welfare and their productivity. In one study, Paul's group visited 66 dairy farms and showed that the amount of negative handling of the cows, the slaps, hits, pushes, and tail twists delivered by the staff, gave a positive correlation with avoidance of the handler, cows avoiding the handler in a standardized approach test, a positive correlation with the level of stress-related hormone cortisol in the milk, and a negative correlation with yearly milk yield in the herd. From this and other findings, Paul and co-workers developed the hypothesis that negative handling by a stock person or inconsistent handling, which is almost as bad, creates a state of chronic fear of humans in the animal, triggering a classic stress response and the release of cortisol, resulting in reduced growth, reproduction, and immune competence. Paul's group has also shown that this is partly a matter of people's attitude toward animals. In one study of, of dairy farms, they used a questionnaire to identify the workers who described cattle 
in pleasant terms such as stimulating, entertaining, and intelligent, versus those who describe them in negative terms such as noisy, smelly, and ugly. And they found that staff with a positive attitude toward the animals used more pleasant forms of contact in handling them, and this in turn was correlated with lower fear responses and so on. So the selection and training of staff, including selecting staff who appreciate animals and enjoy working with them, is a way to improve animal welfare, productivity, and as well as creating a more enjoyable work experience for the people. And the working environment can affect the welfare of both people and animals and how they interact. In one recent study, Rob Burton and colleagues looked at a number of dairy farms in uh, New Zealand, like this one, and noted how the physical setup of the building, the design of the milking area, the quality of the walkways, and so on, can lead either to an easy flow of people or the reverse. And these features then combine with the handling skill of the workers and the personality of the cows to create a culture of how things are done. And, and Burton and colleagues emphasized the key importance of designing systems and structures that promote positive interactions between humans and animals. We had a dramatic example of this in a, on a farm in Canada not long ago that used a rotary, a rotating milking parlor for dairy cows, but was buying cattle from other farms where the animals were used to different systems of housing and different kinds of milking parlors. These older cows were reluctant to get on the rotary milking system, and the staff then used more and more aggressive means of getting them onto the, onto the milker. Uh, this descended into a situation in which was finally reported to the authorities and people were actually charged with cruelty to animals. I think the moral of the story is that we have these three elements, the animals, the people, and the environment, which affect each other in complicated ways and need to work in harmony to create a good environment for the animals, the people, and to promote positive interaction. So to conclude, uh, improving animal welfare often improves human welfare and vice versa, as we see in animal transportation, uh, animal sheltering, animal uh, rehabilitation, animal production, and so on. And some of the practical messages for animal producers are that we need staff who enjoy working with animals, staff who are trained in good handling of animals, and environments that work well for both the animals and the people. All right, a second message under the One Welfare theme is the need to coordinate actions between animal welfare and human welfare services in order to achieve better outcomes for both animal and human welfare. Of course, the need to coordinate animal and human services is well established in the case of violence toward animals. And I'm sure we're all uh, aware uh, to, to some degree of the connection between violence to animals and violence to people, especially children and spouses. Social work professor Frank Ashione has been doing work in this area for many years. And just one example of his work was a study called Battered Pets and Domestic Violence, which followed uh, over a hundred women escaping from violent partners. And it found that women residing at domestic violence shelters were nearly 11 times more likely to report that their partner had hurt or killed pets than a comparison group of women who said they had not experienced intimate violence. And, in some cases, the threat of harm to the animals was so severe that they delayed escaping from violent partners because of fears for the animal's safety. So here we see especially the need for animal protection services and uh, child protection and domestic violence shelters to work together. The first person to see an abused child may be an animal protection officer responding to a complaint about animals. And if a domestic violence shelter doesn't coordinate with an animal shelter so that the pets are looked after, uh, women may, may avoid using their services. A topic that has had much less research is the neglect of animals and the role of human mental health 
This is a real need because neglect or failure to provide even a, a minimal level of care is, is a significant issue with farm animals, and research now shows that many of these cases involve a, 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 an element of human health and mental health. For example, a, a Danish study of farmers charged with neglect of animals showed that neglect is embedded in a complex network of other problems in agriculture, and that these include especially severe financial difficulties, divorce, and psychiatric problems. The other recent study of, of, of farm animal neglect was done in Ireland, and it investigated uh, 13 cases uh, where farmers had been charged with neglect of farm animals. In five of the cases, the farmers had age and health-related difficulties that rendered them in, unable to provide appropriate care, especially when emergencies arose. In four cases, the problem involved depression or other problems of mental health, often linked to family stress or economic challenges, as we saw in the Danish study. And in only four cases, the problem seemed to be that the farmer didn't attach high priority to animal welfare, for example, by not seeking veterinary treatment because of cost. Now, in the last four cases, uh, we, these might respond to education or retraining, but in the others, the majority of cases, solving the animal welfare problem requires that we deal with the underlying problems of human welfare. We're finally starting to see some uh, in, attention being paid to mental health issues in the farm community. In the Canadian province of Quebec, for example, research shows that farmers have a higher suicide rate and a much higher rate of work-related stress than people in other occupations. This has led the, uh, the Farmers Association in Quebec to tackle the problem and establish a mental health representative in each of their regions and to create a system of 600 individuals that they call sentinels. These are veterinarians, uh, uh, feed salespeople, others who visit farms frequently, who receive one day of training that allows them to identify uh, problems of incipient suicide and simply to know how to make referrals. The hoarding of animals is another serious animal welfare problem uh, because of the number of animals involved and the duration of suffering and ill health that can, can occur in each case. Veterinarian Gary Patronik has studied hoarding for much of his career and helped found the uh, HARC, the Hoarding of Animals Research Consortium. And thanks to Dr. Patronik and others, we now have a reasonable understanding of the problem. Oh, uh, Patronik identifies classic hoarders as people who accumulate many animals that overcome their ability to provide care, fail to acknowledge the deteriorating condition both of the environment and of the animals, and fail to recognize the harm being done to their own health and well-being. It used to be thought that hoarding of animals or of, of objects was a, a, a form of obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, research now suggests that this is a, its own form of mental illness caused hoarding, called hoarding disorder, which actually also involves other problems of mental health. One study of uh, cases of object hoarding showed that people with hoarding disorder had major depression in 57% of cases, social phobia in 29%, generalized anxiety disorder in 29%, and obsessive compulsive disorder in 17%. Th the clear message here is that addressing this problem of animal welfare also requires attention to the underlying problem of human health. If an animal welfare intervention isn't accompanied by a mental health intervention, the person is likely to simply reoffend. The need to coordinate animal welfare and human welfare is also clear in the case of disaster relief. Here is a photo photograph from Hurricane Katrina illustrating the reluctance of people to evacuate from danger unless they can assure the safety of their pets. And in fact, this became such an issue during Hurricane Katrina that the U.S. now has protocols in place for the rescue of pets in disaster relief. 
And elsewhere in the world, we see many millions of small-scale livestock owners, where the rescue of the animals is the top priority after a natural disaster, because the animals provide the livelihood for the family. This photograph was taken after the 2015 earthquake in Nepal, and we see a family and its animals sharing a temporary shelter. And if the shelter is too small, there is a good chance it will be used for the animals rather than the people. So to summarize, we see a clear need to coordinate animal welfare and human welfare services in cases of violence, in cases of neglect, in hoarding and disaster relief, and undoubtedly in other areas as well. Finally, the One Welfare concept also reminds us that protecting the environment is fundamental for both human and animal welfare. A classic example is the introduction of invasive species into environments where they can't fit into a functioning ecological system. In 1859, uh, an enthusiastic sportsman named Thomas Austin imported 24 uh, rabbits from England to Australia, saying, The introduction of a few rabbits could do little harm and might provide a touch of home in addition to a spot of hunting. Well, within 10 years, the rabbits, having done what rabbits do, numbered in the millions and by the 1880s they were creating a major ecological crisis by denuding the countryside and driving other species to extinction. Starting in 1901, Australia began building 3,000 kilometers of rabbit-proof fence, a tiny section of which is shown here, to prevent the rabbits from spreading to the western part of the country. It was a textbook example of how the introduction of invasive species can cause immense loss and hardship for people and animal suffering on a vast scale, both for native animals and for the introduced animals themselves. Another example is pollution. As a child, I lived close to Lake Erie, which lies on the border of Canada and the US and is the world's 10th largest surface of fresh water. In historic times, Lake Erie was a very complex and functional ecological system that also supported a major fishery. By the time I came to know the lake, it looked more like this. Essentially, uh, the lake had become so polluted by agricultural runoff, municipal sewage, and industrial effluent that this had created an immense bloom of algae. And as this biomass decomposed, that used up the oxygen in the water uh, and caused major die-offs of animal life. The result was a catastrophic loss to the people, especially those who lived from the fishery, an aesthetic loss to everyone who lived near the lake, and a vast problem of animal welfare as countless animals died from suffocation or starvation in the collapsing ecological system. Well, we're probably all familiar with this kind of eutrophication happening in small farm ponds, but to see this happen in a, a, a water body the size of Lake Erie was mind-bending. Today, however, it is also happening in areas of ocean, in what are called coastal dead zones. And a recent uh, review of, of the problem concluded Dead zones have now been reported from more than 400 systems, affecting a total area of more than 245,000 square kilometers, that's roughly the size of the United Kingdom, and causing mass mortality. As a final example, climate change and associated events such as coastal flooding and extreme weather obviously affect people and animals alike. In one recent attempt to understand the effects of climate change on animals, biologist Chris Thomas and a large team applied climate change models to a wide range of animal species and regions of the world, and they wrote, we predict on the basis of mid-range climate warming scenarios for 2050 that 15 to 30 percent of species in our sample of regions and taxa will be committed to extinction. And if that prediction is even approximately accurate, climate change will have profound effects on a huge number of animals. Now, the extinction of species is often seen as a problem of conservation 
and not thought of as a problem of animal welfare. But it's almost impossible to imagine driving a species to extinction without also causing the classic animal welfare problems. As, as, as stated by a couple of Canadian colleagues, the same human activities driving the current extinction crisis are also causing suffering, fear, physical injury, psychological trauma, and disease in wild animals. My conclusion is that in this century, when the human population is having such profound effects on the planet, problems like invasive species, pollution, and climate change will prove to be some of the greatest threats to animal welfare and human welfare in our time. Now, conservation and animal welfare are often thought of as separate activities involving separate kinds of organizations and sometimes coming into conflict, for example, over predator control. But as these examples show, we have global issues that are major threats to both animal welfare and conservation. And the two movements need to work together in order to solve their common problems. And on the one welfare theme, I think we are now in a century when protecting the life-sustaining processes of nature is a major challenge for both human and animal welfare. So, what do we mean by one welfare? Well, as a concept, one welfare serves as a call to recognize the many interconnections between human welfare, animal welfare, and the integrity of environment. And in practice, it's also a call for to, uh, a coordinated response to improve animal welfare in order to improve human welfare and vice versa, to coordinate actions between animal protection services and other services, and to protect the life-sustaining processes of nature as a fundamental step for both human and animal welfare. Thank you for your kind attention. And thank you for joining me in a discussion of the emerging concept of One Welfare.